Good morning, church. It's great to see each of you here today on this fifth Sunday after Easter. Here we are already in the month of May and it's gorgeous outside and now we all remember, oh right, New England. This is great, isn't it? It's great to see each of you here today in person and on the live stream. To begin, I just want to share a few announcements. This upcoming Saturday, we have an opportunity to celebrate the fact that mothers are um, through an activity called Paint and Plant. I hope you saw the announcement on your um, Thursday e-news and then also in, we'll be promoting it through Facebook. It is open to people of all ages. If you like to paint or you like to plant, you're invited to come and to participate. Also, we have upcoming another couple things um, throughout this month. We have Peacemakers, which Jane is gonna tell us about, but before I invite her up, that will be on May 15th. And then on May 16th, I'm inviting you to a Zoom call um, focused on working on understanding and addressing racism. And that's for everyone high school age and up. And then on May 23rd, which is the Feast of Pentecost, we have Evensong. And it will be a live in-person and live streamed event as well. So for many of these, aside from the Zoom call on working on understanding and addressing racism, the other three all have registrations. And so I hope that you've noticed that on the announcements as they've come through. And so with that, I wanna invite Jane Lindenberg, our, our youth ministry coordinator who does so much to envision how to be God's hands and feet in this world to come and share with us about peacemakers. Good morning, church. I am Jane Lindenberg. I am so excited to be here with you today in person and to tell you about our new community event that St. Stephen's is hosting on the lawn on Saturday, May 15th, as Whitney mentioned. You may have seen banners go up on Main Street this weekend promoting peacemakers. Peacemakers will be an interfaith, intergenerational learning experience for people of all ages, from young families to grandparents and everyone in between. The event will feature teenage speakers from many religions who will talk to us about their own favorite faith traditions and hopefully in the process help us better understand and respect one another and perhaps see what we have in common. The event will also feature live music with performances by the high school quartet from the Suzuki School of Ridgefield, thanks to Abigail Watley, and by high school saxophonist Ellen Norwitt. Families who attend will receive a take-home activity kit chock full of books and craft activities that have been designed by our teen speakers. As usual, we hope our St. Stephen's Parish community will support the event not only by signing up, as Whitney mentioned, to attend, but by liking, commenting, and most importantly, sharing our posts on Facebook. It really does help get the word out in the community. Thank you to the Vestry and to Sarah Armstrong in particular, and to a committed group of adult and youth volunteers who are working very hard behind the scenes to help make this very first Peacemakers event happen. Thank you, Parrish. We look forward to seeing you on May 15th. Thank you, Jane. Thank you for your vision of this event calling us together to reflect on what it means to find ourselves in our faith tradition. And we don't think about this until we are called together to think about it. So thank you so much for making this happen. You don't have to have a kid to come. So just keep that in mind as you consider this. And now I invite you to take a moment of silence as we center ourselves and let the world settle down around us, make space within our hearts and minds to hear what it is that God has to offer us as we come together this morning in worship.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom may I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What is it to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Now we will do a responsive, um, a unison reading from the book of Psalms. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading from 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the anointing sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loves us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. But this, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us, Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or a sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Love, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. There's only one of us here. That's what the woman said on the screen. I had been listening to her. It was a Zoom call. There were lots of us there. Her statement confused me. There's only one of us here. So conditioned am I to an either-or way of thinking, a binary answer to any question, that I thought, I think I'm on the same side as you, so wouldn't you count me too? There's only one of us here, she said. And after a pause, in which all the questions I just now shared with you had run through my head, she said, we are one. That is true. We hear people talk about karma. What you put into the world comes back to you. And there's something true about that statement, but I wonder if the truth of it is simply because everything is always in motion between you and me. And it's in that relationship that we are one. Whether seen or unseen, we are connected one with another. And so our oneness is true, whether we notice it or not. I love the image of the body for this. Blood which courses through our veins may be found at any moment in any part of us, cycling again back through the heart and going out again to the rest of the body again. But it's all the same. This image of our oneness grabs hold of me when I hear the news. We realized this week that our world is on a trajectory of COVID positive rates that has surpassed even the last highest number. 800,000 cases a day around the globe. It is an unfathomable number. Our brains literally cannot conceive it. And this is since we've been keeping track since January of 2020 What sense are we to make of what to do about all of this? There are some people that say, it's just a virus. You can't capture it. It's in the air and you'll either get it or you won't. And you know what, they're right. They're right on the impossibility of catching air. They're right on recognizing the magnitude of this virus. They're right on recognizing that everyone's going to die sometime or another. There are others that say, we need to all get vaccinated in order to stop this thing. My own body is not only my own. What I do with it actually affects others. And you know, they're right too. 
seeing that I take the air we breathe into my lungs and then I put it back out for everyone to share, means that my body makes a difference. I can attempt to put into the world that which is safe for you. I can give into our common environment something that you would actually be glad to receive, something which is safe for you. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus says. What we share, we share. Do you remember learning about vines and branches when you were in middle school? Or was it high school back then? Education has advanced in how early they teach things. I think it might have changed over the last couple of decades. I remember drawing the image of a plant and the dirt and marking the parts of the plant using colored pencils. I loved assignments that included colored pencils. How the plant draws up the water and minerals from the ground. And the plant takes sunlight in, which gives chloroplasts energy to make sugar which is synonymous with food. I remember being really glad to learn that sugar and food were the same thing. The plant releases oxygen into the air through this process and the plant takes in carbon dioxide. Do you remember putting the leaf under the microscope so that you could see the veins? Veins are what we have. We breathe in oxygen and give off carbon dioxide. And I remember as a kid learning that we and plants were in direct relationship with one another, like a, like a puzzle piece. We just snapped together. I couldn't live without them, and they couldn't live without me. The biodiversity of this world and how we're all interconnected is as unfathomable as the number 800,000. It just blows our minds. It's hard to conceive. We definitely can't take it around with us all the time, conscious of that reality. It would be too much. Who could even get the dishes done if we were constantly thinking about how it is that all of this works? The questions loom large. We cannot fully comprehend the significance of what we do or we don't do. If we're honest with ourselves, we like to know that there's a right way. It seems to me that white folks, having been in charge of everything for such a long time, will actually want to change the question so that we can be in charge of the answer. But it's Jesus that gives us the question. How does what you're doing demonstrate love for one another, Jesus asks. How does what you're doing demonstrate the love that you've received in me? This passage of scripture that we read for our gospel lesson today is Jesus talking at the Last Supper. He's sitting with all of his disciples, these that have broken bread with him time and again over three years, who have worn out their sandals together, who have been with each other day in and out. They've had lots of conversations over those three years. Remember, there was nothing to distract them from being with one another. No screens, no media of any sort. When you walked along the road, that's all you did. So inevitably, certainly, Jesus has had many conversations with his disciples before this one, but he knows that this is gonna be the last. And so he wants to give them some things to hold on to. I am the vine, you are the branches, he tells them. It's important to remember this gospel, the Gospel of John, is written between 80 and 110 of the Common Era. Now, Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead in the 30s. So this gospel is written some 50 to 80 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. A lot has happened between then and now, now being when the gospel was written. And the writer was likely writing from Ephesus, not writing from Asia Minor, not from Jerusalem. In the time between Jesus' resurrection and the writing of the Gospel of John, there had been a Jewish revolt in Israel against the Roman Empire in 67 of the Common Era, and the end result of all of that was the destruction of the Second Temple. The wall that's in Israel now, the Wailing Wall, is the remaining wall from the destruction of the Second Temple back in 70 of the Common Era. Ephesus, 
where the Gospel of John is believed to have been written, was in Asia Minor, the area where Paul traveled on his missionary journeys. And Paul's missionary journeys had already been completed by the time John's Gospel had been written. Paul's letters were written before any Gospel was written down. I say all of this to highlight for you that life was not easy then. When the Gospel of John was penned, things were not rosy. There had been a ton of conflict, a ton of bloodshed. So this commandment that Jesus had given way back when was feeling even more pertinent pertinent at the time of its writing. It had been applied, I'm sure, over and over again. Jesus' commandment that we love one another. It was hard. It is hard. But keeping Jesus' commandments is how we're grafted on the vine. It's the way in which Jesus' joy is in us and our joy is complete because that which flows through the plant comes to the branches and circles back around again. We are one. There's only one of us here. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. That's what Paul wrote in his letter to the church in Galatia. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's that which comes from the vine and the branches. The other fruits of the Spirit are love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what makes those, those are the little buds that turn into the fruit that then feed and sustain and make more. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. When I have those moments of feeling like I can do nothing, I return to my cognizance, my awareness of being grafted on the vine. I return so that I can recognize what energy I get from the vine. How is the vine feeding me? How is the vine sharing all that it has so that I grow and produce the fruit that will last? If we return to science and the law of thermodynamics, the law about the conservation of energy, we remember that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change. And so it is that the minerals and the water that come up through the vine and go to the branches create the fruit. And as the fruit gives off and makes more, then more grows. The energy is changed again and again and again. It's the fruit that, is, that grows from us. We can notice what we're grafted onto by our fruit. And currently, I see a lot of fruit that is something I don't want to see in this world. The fruit of fear, of violence, of deception, of intolerance, of impatience, short-sightedness. This is the fruit that we see in this world. And when we reflect on it, we see that we've been growing it for quite a while. This past week, in another news story, as our president gave an address and the Republican response came as well, I was challenged by the thinking that was reflected there in Senator Tim Scott's comment that America is not a racist country. My first response was, where exactly from South Carolina are you from? I would like to live there. If your experience is that America is not a racist country, then I want to be in the bubble you are in. I am in a really great bubble right here in Ridgefield, Connecticut, I have to say, but that sentence makes me think there might be a better bubble somewhere else. I know of people's commitment to not be racist on a personal and interpersonal level, but I also know that there are laws that privilege some people over others, and I'm not against laws that create some form of hierarchy, except to the extent that they dehumanize others. And that's where it really grates. 
That's what I've been seeing more and more of over these last, this last year. I know of a teacher who teaches in an underprivileged area, mostly middle and lower income students. And he told me of one of his kids who was in a rented apartment and informed him that he would be moving, going to live with family somewhere else because the landlord was evicting them. Now I know there are laws that make it possible to evict tenants that don't pay. I understand how that works. And I also thought that we had tried to make some adjustments to that so that a young person wouldn't be uprooted three quarters of the way through the school year and plopped down in the middle of another school system. I honestly wonder, will that kid get connected? How? In this mess that we're in, the reality that we're in, how does a kid get connected in a new school district? I have heard educators say that they are literally afraid they're going to lose kids. Not that they're going to lose a year of math or a year of science, but literally lose them. That kids will become disjointed from community and fall out and into other ways of relationship. That is a big cost for us as a society. I don't fault anyone for following the rules. I'm just simply here to say, what do we do when the laws are against our humanness? Heather McGee gives a TED Talk entitled, Racism Has a Cost for Everyone. She's a policy wonk by her own admission. That's her job, to look at data and statistics and to understand what affects things. And so she found herself surprised at the ways that various structures will hurt us all. She cited one specific event as a perfect illustration for what she was trying to share. Back in Montgomery, Alabama, back in the 50s, she reminded us that in the 30s and 40s, there was a lot of national spending on public goods for everyone's benefit. And in Montgomery, Alabama, there was the Oak Park Pool. It was, again, as you can imagine, a real treat in the heat of the humid summer of Alabama. And people would spend their day there. The way she describes it, splashing and sunning and resting in the shade. This public good was funded by public money, but in that time, it was for whites only. And so when the federal government handed down a ruling that everything should be desegregated that was funded by public dollars, the town declared on January 1st, 1959, that they were going to fill in Oak Park Pool. It never opened again. In Montgomery, Alabama, for a decade, they closed down their parks department. That is painful. Where does the energy go when it's no longer built on relating to one another, but keeping one another out? Returning to the law of thermodynamics, the energy cannot be added or changed, but only added or subtracted, but only changed. It makes me wonder where did all that goodwill go? That energy of creation, of enjoyment of creation, of being in relationship with one another, where did that energy go? I can admit that we can call it what you will. If you don't want to call it racism, then don't call it that. I think it's nice to have a shared definition of terms, but I'm not here to wordsmith anything. I'm not talking about a theory. I'm talking about people's lives. I'm talking about how to make lives better in relationship with one another. I know that we're all going to die sometime or another, but what about now? What can motivate us to change the energy? Stories like the Oak Park Pool motivate me. 
The effort of power hoarding puts me in a place of defensiveness, and I don't want to be in a place of defensiveness. Power hoarding makes me have to look at the other as a threat or an enemy, and I literally don't have time for that. Literally don't have time for that. And so it is that when I can find myself doing nothing, I return to the vine, remember how I'm grafted on in baptism, and hear the words of Scripture again. The letters of John, the one letter that we've read from today, it's the longest one. You should see two and three. They're like a paragraph. But these letters followed John's gospel and are believed to be written by someone in the Johannine community, not by the same gospel writer. They're believed to be, have been written following a schism which happened within their own community. And so we hear verses 16 through 20, 21 in the passage that we read today. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. My friends, we are all somewhere between bad and good at this. On the spectrum, none of us has reached perfection. And so we have no place to judge the other, none. But we can ask the question, how does what we're doing reflect our love for brothers and sisters? What are we gonna do now? And when we feel ourselves paralyzed, we may take a moment to remember the vine on which we're grafted, to return again to the good news so that we might be fed and the fruit that comes forth from our lives can be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gent gentleness and self-control. We cannot produce this fruit. Jesus reminds us, apart from me, you can do nothing. And then I'm like, oh, is that why this is so hard? Our faith informs our actions. That is why I'm inviting you to that hour-long Zoom call to look at working on understanding and addressing racism, not because I have the answer nor because you do, but because brothers and sisters are hurting, and some of them look like us. It's why we're having peacemakers on May 15th, so that we can remember the diversity of God's creation, can take a moment in the peaceful beauty of New England to receive the goodness that we hear from our brothers and sisters in this world because we don't want to be liars. How do we love our brothers and sisters? That's the question. Well, Jesus reminds us that it requires us to lay down our lives, our lives of comfort, our lives that tell us this bubble is great. Because it is the, that, that bubble living, which actually costs others their lives. We can't do this on our own, my brothers and sisters, but that's okay to realize because we are the branches on the vine. Through Jesus, we have been grafted on the vine. It happened in our baptism, and it is through the vine that we receive all that we need to sustain us. So when we find ourselves frozen, unable to do anything, we are called back into the scriptures, back into the story of our faith, just as we read in the book of Acts where the eunuch says to Philip, how can I understand this? I don't have anyone to tell me about it. And so it is that Philip recounts the whole salvation story. I want to remind you of this book. If you haven't read the Bible in its entirety, then just get this little version. 
Because when you come to know the whole salvation story, you realize you have what you need to love one another. In Jesus, we are always called to grow in our love for one another, but we must know the risen Lord. And I know that when we do that, people will begin to see the good news. They will begin to see the fruit of the Spirit. They'll see our love, our joy, our peace, our patience, our kindness, our goodness, our faithfulness, our gentleness, our self-control, and that fruit will be sweet to their taste. And they will realize that in receiving it, they too can be a part of the vine and receive all the goodness that God has to, for us in the risen Lord. In the spirit of Easter, let us remember our call and response. Alleluia, Christ is risen. I invite you now to stand as we affirm our faith and say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to turn and share a sign of God's peace. Please be seated. Special thank you to those who are participating and helping leading worship this morning, especially Nora and Barbara, who are our duet today. Alcee is back at the Oregon Console, and it's great to have him home. And the Jonathan, of course, up there making it all happen so that we don't have to worry about walls too terribly much. 
Um, and it is great to see each of you all here today. And, um, and for those of you that are visiting with us today, it's really a delight to see new faces. This, is, this has been a neat thing, you know, because the wall of the sanctuary is permeable now with the live stream possibilities. So um, it's been delightful to find people in person and then outside of this space who are finding a space at St. Stephen's to come and to center ourselves on the good news so that we might carry it out into the world. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it right, is right to give him thanks and, and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light, inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. 
Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. We acclaim you, Holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care so that, in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior, incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To the prisoners he proclaimed freedom. To the sorrowful he proclaimed joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks... He gave it to them and said, drink the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us, this bread and this cup, we praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Stir in your church, remember all your people and those who seek your truth. Remember those that we remember on our prayer list forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. God of love and grace, of justice and peace, we give you thanks that in the sacrament of the altar, you assure us of your presence within us and within the body of Christ, the faithful through all the generations. Grant that we who have witnessed anew these holy mysteries, though unable to receive the philosophical elements of the sacrament, may be moved by your indwelling spirit ever more fully to embody your holy and life-giving presence, reshaping in your likeness the world around us until we are gathered at last into the fullness of your glorious and eternal presence through Christ our risen Lord. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.